Many moons ago, more than 20 years ago, when I joined the GSR, Mansell was a name on a piece of paper. And I heard he left the country. And I thought, did this person flee the country? But he was such an activist and reading the documents. And I thought, look, it can't be that this person left the country. What happened? Um, will we ever see more writings, more research and so on? So now 20 years or more year, um, later, it is wonderful um, seeing Mansell, being part of um, these talks um, and sharing information of his research with us and in, in GGSR. So not just writing, but hearing. It's a wonderful experience, um, something that we didn't have 20 years ago. And it doesn't matter if uh, Mansell is in Japan, very far away from home, as we discussed earlier, home is still South Africa for Mansell. Now the topic of the day is a very hot topic, even if uh, Mansell described it as a boring one. But when you touch with of politics and you know the impact it had on families, it had on local people, it had in the broader community, then this topic um, looking at what we are dealing with, with all these different investigations in South Africa at this time. Um, it's in, it makes interesting history. So he's going to take us back um, and show us a little bit about what he discovered with his very thorough way of scratching in places where um, sometimes you should not scratch. So I hope we're going to, <laughs> you're going to, to share with us how one get about um, documenting, finding these type of information as well. Because looking back maybe 20 years from now at the history that we are living in, um, it might help us a little bit to have a more objective feeling and, and perspective. Mansell, over to you. Thank you, Pietro. Bye, Danke. Thanks so much for your very kind introduction. And uh, well, <clears throat> good day to all. Uh, thank you very much for making time to, to watch and and listen to me yeah i think peter summed it up very nice um like my crop right so the topic is i think as peter has mentioned quite um apt for for the times that we live in and i think maybe it's also been uh influenced by the lawfare that's taking place internationally the fact that south africa is now at the international court um taking on the state of israel the whole question of um you know um law international law and um one has to ask the question you know how does this impact on 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 us in terms of our ancestry so i have not forgotten that you know we are all genealogists and this is um, our main focus but you know the VOC. So I'm going to be a little anecdotal because um, I just to give you an idea of where I'm coming from, as they say. I I remember um, as when I was still a diplomat and posted to Tokyo in the South African Embassy, I attended a diplomatic event and um, there were a whole lot of diplomats from different countries. And you know Japan, of course, has diplomatic relations with almost every country in the world. So there were a lot of diplomats from many places. And it turned out that in this huge group of people, there were eventually only three of us, I think, that had clustered together. And I looked at the, the people around me and I said, do you realize that we three have something in common? Because the one diplomat was from Sri Lanka. The other was from Malaysia. And of course, myself from South Africa. And I said, do you realize that what we have in common? And of course, they looked at me confused. And I said, well, we're the only three in this whole room that are doubly colonized. Yes, doubly colonized. So we were colonized by the Dutch, and then we were colonized by the Brits, um, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, South Africa. Because as you know, Van Ribbeck went oh, to Malacca yes, after the Cape. Yes. And Malacca is part of Malaysia. Um, and that's where Maria de la Kayari, the first Mrs. Van Ribbeck, because he married twice, well, is buried. She lies buried at Malacca. And I, years ago, I went to her grave and at Malacca. It was a very, very emotional experience to actually stand 
stand there and realize, wow, this is, you know, from Cape, from the Cape of Good Hope to Malacca. Anyway, so my talk is entitled Nareipa de Liberasi. So anyone read, knowing English or Afrikaans can, can understand Dutch. And this is an important point to make. Dutch doesn't have to be this language that is inaccessible. Alles behalve, it's very accessible to both English speakers and Afrikaans speakers. So just looking at the words, you can immediately see it almost looks like English after ripe deliberation. And some Afrikaans speakers might even say, ooh, that lakes was Anglicismus die. Near. These are not Anglicisms. These are Netherlandisms. This is true Dutch. So, Narepe Deliberasi is an expression that comes up in all of these VOC records, especially because most of the records are were kept by the company, and it was usually in a committee form, people forming councils and commissions. And what's so interesting is to see how this expression just crops up everywhere. And every time a decision is made, then they'll say, Nare per deliberasi, we have come, we have made the following decision. And it, it speaks to me because it tells me that people were not making impulsive decisions. They were making cool, calm, collected, well considered, mulled over, cogitatingly made decisions. And that smacks of, of responsibility, accountability, of doing the right thing. Being, as um, I've been transcribing a lot of, um, of the work of John Norden, a surveyor in, in, in England in the, in the 17th, 16th century, where he talks about the importance of judiciousness, to be judicious. And this word judicious is very special because it does mean to balance things, to consider things deeply and to evaluate um, rationally and, and then to implement what you have decided. So, you know, this is, this is in a sense what, what comes out of these VOC records for me. Okay, so the, just looking at the... Um, at the topic, Narepa de Liberasi, Cape of Good Hope is a rules-based society, and the men sitting in judgment at the trials of ex of the exiled Prince of Ternate and the banished convict Krutikatling of Pulikat. Okay, so just very quickly, um, Krutikatling is well known by now. She was the first convict that was banished to the Cape. Uh, from Batavia, from Jakarta today, um, and she was banished for having committed what is generally called manslaughter, um, so culpable homicide. She was um, at Reisweik, which was a, a minor fortress um, beyond the castle of Batavia at Jakarta, and um, she was she brought some cooked meat to her to her lover he was a slave class from malabar and he um he wasn't in a good mood that day and he kind of pushed the food out of her hands and she didn't take kindly to that and she got very angry and um they ended up coming to blows and she got grounded physically and of course uh, she struck back with a cobblestone and she pierced his bladder and he died a few days later three three days or so later um and of course she was then arraigned and put on trial and sentenced convicted and then sentenced and actually sentenced to death and then of course um the governor general Matsaker, eventually pardoned her and she was then confiscated because she was a private slave belonging to a mixed race woman she was confiscated and then banished as a company slave to the cape of good hope and of course she goes in the return fleet and in the same return fleet as my answer 
who's of course the Basson stammoder. My my grandmother was a Basson, so very important ancestor to me personally. And um, as is Khrutika Train, because like most um, South Africans having a colonially induced past, we all, many of us can claim or can prove descent from Khrutika Train. Um, in my case, more than once. Um, so Khrutika Train gets banished to the Cape and um, the second person is the Prince of Ternate. Um, he also gets banished to the Cape. And he gets banished later in 1704 for raping an old woman and causing a huge embarrassment to the royal family. So as a political measure, the Dutch decide to remove him physically and to send him to the Cape for life. But to be given money, uh, you know, um, maintenance, food, and to be allowed to to quietly exist at the Cape um, and to avoid any further problems for the family and for the VOC. Um, Ternata, of course, is a part of Indonesia. It's a small island, but it was one of the most important islands in terms of the spice trade with nutmeg. Um, and it was a powerful, um, a po powerful sultanate in, in, in um, the Indonesian archipelago. So it was a major state that the VOC was uh, interacting with at the time. So diplomatically, it was very important that relations were on, on were kept, you know, uh, on an even keel. Right, so in this talk, I, I would like to highlight the role of high-ranking VOC commissioners who visit the Cape of Good Hope to inspect um, and oversee the administration of the colony. In other words, what nowadays has come to be known as good governance. Now, I use the term good governance on purpose because this is a term that's being flouted by the EU, the European Union. They love to say to, to, um, to the African nations, you know, you need good governance and we know how to do it and we can teach you. And uh, if you want to deal with us, then you better show us that you're not corrupt and that you can actually um, behave in a civilized way like we are. And we can then engage, um, you know, in terms of trade. So, you know, and the EU's so kind they even tell us as south africans that we can't use the name port and sherry anymore because you know they belong to the europeans and therefore we should um, we should just quietly accept that and change our labels and then they will deign to trade with us so i i don't have to spell this out but the eu is very dominant and they're not this is not free trade in my book this is um this is a bullying tactic, and we have had to conform and comply, and we have. So in spite of the fact that we have a shared heritage with Europe, and it's because of them that we are where we are, um, we are suddenly now excluded from being able to exercise our, our heritage, our rights to that heritage as Huguenot descendant ref refugees and uh, as you know, people who've been producing wine and port and sherry for a good hundred years. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's a sensitive topic, I think, um, if we think about it more deeply. Uh, so, okay, so rules-based. Um, second point that I wanted to highlight was the, the VOC as a rules-based um, global company, as a corporate structure. And it's very relevant today because if you look at the world, at, at, political situation, you will see that there are corporations that are more powerful than nation states. And in many cases, I mean, I, I witnessed to my horror the opening of the Tokyo Olympic Games, and I couldn't believe that the Japanese allowed the president of the Olympic, Olympic whatever they call themselves, to, to appear at the same time with the emperor at the opening. This is unthinkable and, and totally against protocol. The emperor is the emperor of Japan. He's the head of state. And he should have been given, you know, the, the rightful place of honor and not on the same level as this international bureaucrat. 
who was forcing his way onto the stage and saying, I'm more powerful than than even you guys. So that's that's the kind of thing, you know, that that, that that's playing out um, on the international stage where you've got inter, uh, international organizations and, and companies that are so powerful. So this raises the whole question of, you know, who who calls the shots, who's in charge, um, who controls the situation. Um, and, if, you know, the VOC was the first or one of the first real global corporations together with the English in East India Company. And this is important because because we were, of course, colonized by the VOC. We tend to look at things more from the point of view of the VOC. But we forget that there was an overlap. There was a time when the Dutch actually conquered England in 1688 in the Glorious Revolution. And then um, the King William III was not just Prince of Orange and, and of course, the Stadtholder of uh, four of the provinces of the United Dutch Republic, but he was also then King of England and King of Ireland and King of, of, of Scotland. Um, so the overlap is amazing because this happens at, during Van der Stel's time, the first Van der Stel, and you've got the, um, the English are finally, you know, allowed to stop at the Cape and, and they bring slaves. And of course the Dutch are happy and Van der Stel's happy and everyone's happy because they're all benefiting from this new cooperation between the Netherlands and, and, and Britain. And of course, England had had four wars with the Dutch. So, you know, it was finally time to, to bury the hatchet and to, to, to work together. Um, okay. So, um, and it's interesting that that when William becomes king of England, um, he needs money to fight his wars against Louis the Fourteenth in France, who just happens to be his first cousin too, by the way. And of course, you know um, that, um, and he's married to his first cousin, who's of course a British princess. So it's very genealogically complicated too. But here you have William, who's now presiding over two global companies, the Dutch East India Company, three in fact, the Dutch West India Company, and of course the East, uh, the England um, uh, India Company, East India Company. And these three powerful organizations are providing, you know, funding for his wars. And of course, they all um, um, indulging in, in the slave trade, which of course they have tapped into and which is pre-existing even before the Europeans go to Asia. So when they get there, they they say, "Oh, this is working rather well. We don't we don't do it ourselves anymore." But you know, if that's all that these people trade, uh, then we need to participate if we want to, you know, tap into their wealth and we want to uh, expand our own profits. So yeah, this is an interesting scenario. I think um, just bear in mind that you've got the Dutch West India Company. Some of these people end up at the Cape and they end up going to the East India Company and vice versa. And of course, you've got even descendants at the Cape of my Ancelop and Bengala, who eventually join the English East India Company and become top officials. This is incredible. So, you know, it's fluid. Everything is so fluid and everything is connected. So this is the point. If there's any point that I'm going to make in this presentation, it's that. Everything is connected. And if you look for the connections, you're going to find your research so much more rewarding. Right. So, as I've mentioned, Narepa de Liberasi, it's um, all about judiciousness. Um, the relevance of my topic, as I've said here, it has everything to do with genealogy. I've chosen Sneeman and Yonker progenitors, so you know I wanted to make it really um, to bring home the relevance by choosing Khruta Katrain and by choosing um, the Prince of Ternate, um, Mahmud. And then the next question is why this legal focus? And um, yes, as I've already indicated. I've spoken about who calls the shots, who's in charge in, in the current global climate as well. The law, why the law? And of course, I, I have to quote Gilbert and Sullivan. The law is the true embodiment of everything that's excellent. And I, my lords, embody the law. Of course, this is Gilbertian satire at its best. 
And remember, this is from Iolanthi, where the, the chancellor has a pretty young ward uh, in his charge. And of course, he's a, he's a dirty old man, and he, he keeps the young ward for himself because he's, you know, sexually attracted to her. And uh, so this is an indirect reference to, to pedophilia, I suppose. But the Lord High Chancellor says, you know, I'm, I'm in charge here. I call the shots and, you know, um, I enforce the law. And um, that's how it's, how, how it's re in reality really is. Um, okay, so world order, spoken about lawfare and genocide. So that's the latest topic with South Africa taking on the state of Israel. We're looking at, we have to ask ourselves, you know, why would this, why would South Africa worry about genocide? Um, I think for me, the most compelling question is, that's what went through my mind when, when this case started, was good heavens, but one of the first real instance of genocide that ever happened in world history was the Bushmen. And they were systematically and systemically eviscerated, not only by the VOC, but prior to that, by the Khoi who had come in as, as foreign invaders, by Bantu speakers after the Khoi, uh, the VOC, and then the English. But we have not ever stop to think about you know how did this happen why did it happen and ultimately who's responsible so as much as south africa wants to help palestine the government that is um they need to do some serious soul searching about what's happening back home in terms of our own history and that's not happening and obviously it's not happening because no one wants to go there it's too complicated and it's too sensitive and it's it's a shocking a shocking legacy um so yes um if we go if we look at the, the law and world order right now the united nations has come up with social development goals the elimination of colonialism violence discrimination corruption including nepotism merit even merit is being downgraded there's this promotion of egalitarianism and compliance. So we're looking at a very, a very strange world where everything is moving in one particular direction. And we have to ask ourselves, how did we get there? And, you know, I, for me, it's a very important question because our constitution, as it currently stands, allows the, the government as executive to sign any treaties, multilateral or bilateral without it ever being put to the vote in parliament. Of course, it gets ratified later, and then there will be an, an, an open airing and it will be endorsed by parliament. But by the time that happens, most people don't even know that it, a treaty was signed or that South Africa had committed itself to the International Criminal Court and became a member of that particular international treaty. So, you know, what I'm saying is that I'll our legal relations with the world are so complicated that most people don't even understand them, let alone the lawyers themselves, the international lawyers. We've created monolithic structures that are so vast and so powerful and so intricate that we can't see the wood for the trees. We need to really rethink this. Um, and I think by looking at what happened in our past with the VOC, um, it helps to bring bring home some of those you know, um, questions like, how did we get to where we got? Okay, so once again, the, the International Court is in, in The Hague. Why? Why The Hague? Because Crucius, the father of international law, was a Dutch jurist, and the Dutch are the most famous in terms of, I suppose, codifying the law. And the whole world is now dancing to, to that tune. It's curious because, you know, I was amazed that even recently I, I learned that the Japanese government were helping, but they were sending lawyers from Japan to train Chinese lawyers to implement, you know, um, and upgrade the Chinese legal system. 
and the whole Japanese legal system is Western. It's based on the West. It's, it's so it's not coming from Asia. It's 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 all going back to to Europe. So let's let's not forget that the the European domination of the legal scene is paramount and continues to be so. But then the, the next question is, how did it get to be there? Because it's not necessarily a bad system and it's not necessarily a system that should be branded as evil and disposable. In fact, there's a lot to be said for it being the best option that the world has. So I'll leave you to ponder that um, and let's move on. Um, all right, I wanted to just mention to you that um, I remember when I was at school in Standard 7, we had to learn about civics and about the structure of parliament and the separation of powers and the role of the executive and the legislature. And I remember thinking, God, this is so boring, and yet still being fascinated by it, because at least I can look back and realize it was a very valuable lesson um, that particular day, because um, it has stuck with me to this day where, you know, now when I do my research, I look at the VOC and I think, you know, I need to look at who the guys, the shakers and the movers, the movers and the shakers of the VOC, who are these people? Who are making the decisions? When Khrutika train is put on trial, who are the men that, the, who were the people that actually condemned her? What's their background? How did they come to be judges? And were they good judges? Were they bad judges? Were they um, upstanding people of the, society, of, 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 of the society at the time? All those questions become very, very pertinent. Um, so yes, here you are with this question of who wields the power and, and um, can we find out more about these people and will that help us to understand the situation better? And I think it's an obvious yes. Um, okay, so why VOC? Um, I have already mentioned the VSC as a global power. Um, of course, you know the ironic alternative name, Vergaan onder Corruptie. This is supposedly the reason why the VOC eventually had to be dismantled. And as you know, the VOC was um, in control of the Cape of Good Hope for almost 150 years. It's a long time. And of course, a little bit of background, the company was controlled by 17 directors, the Yiran 17. I think most people know this, but my question is, how well do you think you know the structures of the VOC? I like to be ironic here. I call them strictures as well, because they're not always necessarily structurally good. Um, but what are the structures of the VOC? How did it, how did it um, um, operate in terms of devolution of power? Where did the profits go? Um, who were the shareholders? And this becomes another interesting question because, you know, there's one particular family at the Cape, the DeWitts, um, just very briefly, the, he, he comes to the Cape via Mauritius and Batavia, but he's from New York, which was a Dutch colony, then taken by force by the English and renamed New York after the King James II, who was then Duke of York. And then some of the Dutch stay on and swear loyalty to the English crown, and um, they become pirates and they operate from Madagascar. And uh, De Witt is one of these guys, and he is so knowledgeable of of the Malagasy slave trade and so knowledgeable of the Indian Ocean networks and also, you know, fluent in Dutch and English. So he becomes a very important person at the Cape. Very, very, and the De Witt family become very important. And what's so interesting about them is that even one branch end up back in Malaysia. Um, and they are, you know, a very, very uh, prominent family in Malacca to this day. Uh, 
but they are considered to be Indos, so Mestis, mixed race Eurasian, and they are not, they no longer European, shall we say. And understandably so, because the family's got undergone all these metamorphoses from, as I say, New York to Batavia to Mauritius to Madagascar to the Cape. Um, okay, so just um, I'm going to read this paragraph about the the, the VOC and the Cape. Um, the windswept Cape of Good Hope was a Dutch colonial transliteral holding or possession that emerged quite late. Important. 1652 was very late. At the, the VOC was already operating for a good 30 to 40 years. Um, it's, it emerged quite late in 1652 in an already established colonial empire under the control of the United East India Company. Right, stretching from southern Africa to Timor. So the Dutch parliament gave a charter and sanctioned the operations of the VOC from the Cape of Good Hope to, so basically, I suppose, the start of the Indian Ocean all the way to Timor. So dividing the world literally in half, because the other half was given to the Dutch West India Company, and emulating, aping, imitating the Pope, who had done that with Portugal and Spain. So once again, human beings, for me, they, they always, they, they never uh, surprise me in terms of they never come up with anything new. They just copy what's happened before. And so they, they copy the Pope and they divide the world in two. And the, the VOC operates from Cape, from the Cape to Timor. And they were not supposed to trade in the, um, in the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Of course, there were exceptions and they managed to get away with one particular slave expedition to Guinea, to the west coast of Africa, and to Angola, um, and to bring slaves back, right? But that only happened once, really, two shiploads, and one was a, was a prize. It was ca a captured Portuguese slaver, which brought the slaves to the Cape. But the actual hustle brought slaves from West Africa, but it was only a once-off a once um, expedition, because it, it was basically violating the charter of the uh, of the company. So what's the point here is that the company was given a charter by the Dutch Parliament, the States General. Um, effectively, the VOC was operating as an arm of the Dutch government. And it had the capacity of a military capacity and diplomatic capacity. And it was operating already almost as a state within a state. Uh, this is legally quite important to 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 understand um so right let me just continue reading where i was saying that the um at a, the vsc empire had grafted itself onto an earlier portuguese empire which had already paved the way for increased european colonial expansion into africa and asia dutch trade with asia was organized for the voc in terms of an exclusive charter 1602 from the states general of the united provinces of the free netherlands the dutch republic for trade and enforcement of Dutch interests against competitors. A commercial as well as a government agent in Asia, its business was conducted by a hierarchy of officials called merchants with headquarters in Batavia, Jakarta in Indonesia today, after 1619. The directors of the VOC in the Netherlands were known as the Lord 17. The company was formally dissolved in 1795 and its debts and possessions taken over by the Batavian Republic, the predecessor to the present day Kingdom of the Netherlands. So legally, you'd had this continuation of the Dutch state, although it's undergone various revolutions and uh, transitions in power. The same has happened with South Africa. We have to ask ourselves, how did we get to be in 1995 or 96, whenever we had the so-called New South Africa? That was a misnomer because that we continued legally as a constitutional state. And the whole point of Cadessa and the, the aftermath of Cadessa was that we were not, um, there was no revolution. There, were ne there was never a revolution. There was a continuation of the legal state of the Rechtsstaat and of the nation state known as the Republic of South Africa. Um, so basically the ANC inherited a going concern 
and it kept the same structures. What they did not do and what they should have done, strictly speaking, was to revert back to the status quo ante, which would have been the Union of South Africa under the British Crown. But they didn't do that because they weren't prepared to go that far backwards. So they kind of made a compromise. When I say they, I mean the National Party and the ANC. They compromised and they decided to keep the apartheid state as it existed at the time. Um, so we are still a constituted nation state and legally we evolved out of first Dutch colonialism and then British colonialism. And what's interesting too is that even the legality of the British occupation was legalized by treaties. And the, after way after 1806 and the Battle of Loburg, Britain compensated the Netherlands financially and bought us. And we were sold. We were sold by the Dutch to the British. It's a terrible thought when you think about it. We were actually sold for a mess of pottage. And um, it's, it's, so the legal continuation of the occupation of the right to rule and uh, the legitimacy of the, of the South African state has all been carefully, carefully linked from day one, from the time that Van Riebeek set foot at the Cape. It gets even more interesting because we realize that, um, and I will mention this later in the talk, that the one of the VOC commissioners stopping at the Cape was instrumental in purchasing two pieces of the Cape from the indigenous population at the time. So basically the Khoring Haikwa and the Khoring Khorachukwa, uh, the so-called tobacco thieves, as they were nicknamed, they sold out to the Dutch, uh, the Cape um, district, which is basically the west coast up to Soldana. And of course, Hottentos Holland, which is the Somerset West area, was sold uh, in a second treaty by the Hora Chukwa uh, tribe. So anyway, um, just to continue. So yeah, the... The VOC's main priority at the Cape of Good Hope was to provide support to all of its ships and pl that plied between the Netherlands and the East Indies. Uh, this entailed the running of an efficient hospital, burying the dead and the ready supply of food and drink to the survivors. The colonial encroachment on Aboriginal Khoi or Bushman lands resulted in the signing of treaties, ex post facto, in attempts to legitimize Dutch occupation in terms of international law. The Dutch soon rationalized their ill-conceived occupation of the Cape by transforming the refreshment station into a colony, importing slaves and convicts, granting company employees their freedom to become permanent settlers and expanding territorially, thereby colonizing not only their land, but also the Cape Aborigines themselves. By the time the Cape was fully operational, um, VOC refresh uh, was a fully operational VOC refreshment station, a uh, baton comptoir, a factory, residency, fortified settlement, and a colony. A Creole, multi ethnic Dutch Indies culture had emerged at the tip of Africa. Significantly, the Cape of Good Hope was the only Dutch colony where the Dutch language, albeit creolized and indigenized, effectively took root and evolved into a formalized and institutionalized language, Afrikaans. The Cape of Good Hope for that period is best imagined in terms of the present day Cape Flats, one being drifting, um, once being drifting dunes of sand. Between Cape Town and the second colony of Stellenbosch, there lay a wasteland of prehistoric seabed, making the Cape Peninsula appear to be an island cut off from the rest of Africa. The colony was initially a dumping ground for the VOC's sick, dead, political exiles, and convicts. The place can be summed up by the following key words Fort, Penal settlement, cemetery, hospital, slave lodge, vegetable garden, drinking hole, and brothel. Transferred officials and servants could not be expected to stay there indefinitely, and free burghers, a minority of whom were manumitted slaves, termed free blacks, and their wives, if not legally bound to stay for a fixed period as free citizens, would have opted to leave sooner than later. All right. 
and some even deserted by running or stowing away. There were very few imported women, so that there existed a maximum demand for sexual favors from slave women and detribalized Aborigines. Some European women appreciating this chronic shortage even risked cross-dressing and leaving for the Cape and the East Indies disguised as men. And you might think that there were only a, a handful of such people. It's actually a little more than that, including the Stammudder of the Mayburgs, by the way. She came disguised as a man. A number were discovered even before their ships sailed past the Cape. Then there were many more stowaways and high sea captives. All life revolved around the coming and going of the VOC fleets and their motley crews. Some of them were even black sailors from the east um, and keeping the Hottentots at bay. An overpopulated hospital, multiple burials, illegal trade, either between the ship folk and the Freeburgers or corrupt officials or local Aborigines, fornication, homosexuality, prostitution, gambling, drinking, squabbling, stealing, punishing and killing were the order or the disorder of the day. So the Cape was a wonderful place. It was a place of action. It was a, we forget, you know, ever since the Suez Canal was constructed, we became isolated and we we then started believing that we were exceptional and somehow completely cut off from the world and that we could evolve in isolation. Yes, it did happen after the Suez Canal, but before the Suez Canal, it was a very different picture. Everyone was coming and going and Cape Town was one of the hubs of the world, like Dubai is today. So there was a lot happening at the Cape and it certainly was not isolated. It was very connected to Asia and very connected to Europe and even to New York because of the slave trade happening at Madagascar and the pirates operating from Madagascar, not just the Caribbean, Madagascar. Okay, right, so just general background there. Um, I've spoken already about, you know, the legacy of the VOC in terms of colonialism, its um, commercial monopoly, exploitation, slave labor, Perhaps the, one of the most impressive and disconcerting legacies of the VOC is the displacement of people globally. People were literally transplanted from one continent to another, and either as slaves or as you know, economic refugees or as migrants or as single men hoping to find a fortune, people who had escaped their debts in Europe, for whatever reason, people were coming and going. So this this is a wonderful f field of research because if you'd go in, and if it's your ancestors, it's even more um, energizing because then you start thinking, wow, I mean, there could be any amount of possibilities that brought my ancestors out or in or, you know, to find them even there, like, you know, Yefa, Mirov, even Mirov. Born Krotwa, she's my double ancestor. Many other people descend from her too. But yes, we even tap into the indigeneity of our of our own continent, Africa. Um, right. Um, so the, the VOC's legacy is huge. Um, its impact even on the um, on 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 nature, so on conservation, on on environment, the environmental impact horrific um, in terms of, you know, it's hard to, only now I suppose that we are so much more acutely aware of of how, how vulnerable our planet is and as the world becomes so big and as a result it becomes smaller, we now are more attuned to, to conservation and now we can look back and ask ourselves, what did the VOC do in terms of the extinction of certain breeds of animals and plants? And, and at the same time, you know, um, not just extinction, but promotion, because, you know, uh, it's so amazing to walk around in Tokyo and see proteas and gladiolas and always oh, gladioli on sale. And then I say to my Japanese friends, you know, that flower is indigenous to South Africa. And they say, want to? Like total disbelief. They can't imagine that, you know, how can that flower come from Africa? It can't possibly be. Um, so yes, the, 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 the Dutch certainly moved around and they moved things around too. Very important impact. 
um, and we need to understand it and we need to come to grips with it. And, you know, for whatever reason, and certainly research purposes, you can only benefit by tapping into it more deeply. All right, so the end of the VOC, I've mentioned, I've mentioned its legacy, and now I want to get to commissioners. Now, just another story. Just yesterday, I, I, I did a posting on Facebook about um, uh, Adrian van der Stel selling two slaves at the Cape. Um, and I was taken by surprise because I looked looked at this entry and I thought to myself, wow, um, what's he, why is he selling slaves at the Cape? Oh, Adrian is the son of Simon and he's selling to his brother, Jonker Francois uh, van der Stel. And he is um, on in the return fleet as um, uh, the fiscal, and he stops at the Cape and he, he sells two slave slave young slaves to male slaves to his brother. And um, this is at the time that Willem Adrian van Stel is governor, and of course Papa is retired at Constantia, the previous governor. So already you've got a very interesting picture. You've got father and son, both governors. Hello, what's going here? Like by uh, this is like George Bush, father and son, or the um, the president of um, uh, you know the Indian prime ministers, Gandhi, Gandhi kind of thing. Or you know, in, we had the same thing in Korea and Trudeau in Canada, where you've got these political dynasties. So yes, yeah, the side the van der Stels, the, There's already a hint of nepotism of you know of family networks that are taking place and i was surprised because i i, I looked further and i i didn't realize that Adrian van der Stel owned the ode of Einberg. um so he was granted um what then later became um the military camp and was once used for the hottentot corps as well by both the dutch and the brits when they rounded up all the local indigenous population and used them as for military purposes and in that way they could control them as colonial subjects um just fascinating to think that you know if i ever go to weinberg again to realize wow so this this land belonged to Adrian van der Stel, and wow you know this is a place where i even had to report when i was doing my my military conscription what i now term my national disservice um two years of my life that was stolen from me but it wasn't all bad because um, they put me in the Cape Core, so you know, as a legal officer. So that was rather interesting. Um, anyway, so moving on. Um, so, oh, and one other thing. Also, it dawned on me today when I was looking at the list of the VOC commissions that came to the Cape. Um, I saw the name Simons. I thought, no, this cannot be, because last week. I was transcribing all the court records of the murder of Rikia Krof, of course, is the stammerer of the Fisser family, and from whom I have numerous descents. From her husband, eight descents, but because she's a second wife, uh, not eight of those descents, only some. But Rikia Krof was murdered at Witteboermen, at Constantia, the neighboring farm to Simon van der Sel's Constantia, Ruta Constantia now. And she was 82 years old when she berated her slave for for not chopping the wood in time for her baking. And because she was going to visit her daughter in Cape Town, uh, she, um, she was very angry. And of course, he had been drinking, so he said in his confession, and he had said that he'd gone to look for the cattle that had gone astray. and um, she didn't believe him because the cattle were standing there already. And she said, you know, uh, she took a branch and she threatened him. And then she started beating him with the branch. And he was holding an axe in his hand. And of course, he he axed her in her face and he he grounded her and he literally severed her head. And as this was happening, the slave of their slave, Maria van Koromandel, Maria van Nagapatnam, she screamed out, Mudras do it, Mudras do it. And then old Fisser and his pals came out of the house. They were doing smoking a pipe de buck. Um, and they intercepted Klaas van Malabar. And then, of course, he was arrested and put on trial and executed. 
But guess what? The fiscal at the time, the fiscal, the prosecuting officer was Simons. So he comes back to the Cape later as a VOC commissioner. So he's already lived at the Cape. He already acted as its a prosecuting officer. Um, he's a very powerful official. He has seen people come and go, literally, and he has even been instrumental in having some of them put to death. And he leaves the Cape and he pursues his VOC career, but he comes back, probably with a return fleet, to inspect the colony. And everyone is, of course, aware of him. And they even know him. And he knows the people at the Cape already. What's interesting here is it also shows how the, the commissioners were seasoned officials that had the experience uh, as well, which is not necessarily a bad thing. And in fact, I, I would argue the, the opposite. It's a very good thing in terms of con continuity, in terms of certainty, in terms of if you are going to establish a legal framework, you want consistency and you want constancy. These are very important concepts. And it's interesting that the term constant was a very vogue concept at the time. Stoicism was a popular revitalized um, philosophy during Simon van der Sel's time, which I believe is why he called his place Constantia. Um, there's the famous book by the author at that time, which everyone was basically talking about and everyone was reading. Um, so constancy becomes a, a, a major theme. Okay, so now finally we're looking at the um, we're looking at the commissioners. Um, these people are so interesting, um, and it's interesting too that Anna Biesikin did her thesis on them. Very smart move at a very early stage in her in her academic career. She focused on the source of the power, and I think that was the key to her success, really. Um, when she did her thesis, the Netherlands Commissaris in the 18th eeuwse on the Cape, 1944, one year before the end of World War II. And she had also spent time in the archives in Jakarta. Um, so uh, Dr. Anna Besikin has left a marvelous legacy um, she will always be one of my great, great fans. Um, so when you read a lot of her research, you will see that she she relies heavily on 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 the VOC commissioners, um, and rightly so because of the impact that they had. What I didn't realize for a long, long time was I was also under the impression, like so many other people, that people like Simon van der Sel could make strong decisions and most of the decisions. It so happens that the governor or the commander prior to the governors didn't have much power. Um, if you look at, at, at the arrivals of the return fleet and of the incoming fleet, the inbound, there's always a higher ranking official who's stopping at the Cape, who takes precedence over the commander or the governor and his council. And then they have what they called a Brederat, a broad council. So the highest ranking official then basically chaired the meeting and all problems were put to him. Now you can imagine when the commissioner was formally appointed to inspect the colony, this was happening regularly, if not like every year, every second year. The VOC commissioner would arrive, he would present his papers and the whole colony would quake in their shoes. And you can imagine if you were a prominent slave, private slave in, in, a, in a household of an official, and you had a, a particular gripe, the, the one thing you would be burning to do was to get the ear of the commissioner to try and say, hey, help me, I need your help, or, you know, um, and we actually have incidents where I think the slaves complain, the company slaves in the slave lodge complain about their lack of clothing, and this gets to the ear of the commissioners who, who sort out the problem. Um, so what, what you're seeing here is an organism at work. You're seeing how people are interacting and, and how decisions are being made and how problems are being hopefully resolved or, or aggravated. 
Uh, because, you know, there's not always, you know, nowadays everything is focused on solutions, solutions, but so many of the solutions end up to be new problems rather than solutions. So even the VOC commissions, they were human. They, they weren't always making the right decisions. But more often than not, because they were backed up by accountability, by rules, by constancy, you, fewer mistakes were made. And that's commendable. That's something that we shouldn't just disregard. Um, so getting the ear of the, of the VOC commissioner of visiting the Cape, very important um, um, phenomenon at the Cape or any other colony that was being inspected, but particularly the Cape. So as I said here, as a former diplomat, I, I mean, I, I, I have actually lived this experience where in the embassy in Tokyo, we would get a, um, get a, a telex or, a, you know, electronic email or whatever at that time to say that the minister of, of finance is visiting and drop everything and we have to now get ready for his arrival. Um, or when the president himself would come, which is, you know, it happened as well. And the panic and the consternation and the kowtowing and uh, the groveling and um, unbelievable. Um, because this powerful person is arriving and we now have to make things happen and quickly. Right. So one can, I can, I can, you can read between the lines in the VOC documents how these VOC commissioners come and go and how everyone is on tenterhooks because heads could roll, things could happen, right? Um, so what's interesting too is that mo if you look at the background of these VOC commissioners, most of them were legally trained. They'd all gone invariably to the University of Leiden, um, sometimes Utrecht or other universities, uh, older, some of the also other older universities in the Netherlands. Um, or even outside of the Netherlands, Mats Seiker was went to the University of Louvain, which is in Belgium today, um, and he was supposedly a Catholic, but working for a Protestant company. Anyway, all I'm saying is that if you go into the backgrounds of each of these people, the most amazing things come up. Um, and these people were no, um, you know, they they were no, they were shall we say, people of substance. They were well-educated. They came from, uh, I suppose, established families. Um, they weren't pushovers and they weren't just charlatans necessarily. Although, as I say, one should always keep an open mind. I mean, we're looking at human beings and we're looking at human beings wielding and exercising power and um, even now we can look back and we can hold these people um, to account. And so we should. Um, right. So here's an example of, of, a, of a commissioner arriving and presenting his credentials. So this is from the journal, 29 January, 1700. Honorable Commissioner presents his credentials to the council here as follows. Willem van Oetwoorden, Governor General, etc. with greeting to the reader. Whereas the directors in their preceding letters, and especially in 1656, have been pleased to order that he to whom the command of the return fleet to Holland shall be entrusted, shall be likewise qualified and empowered as commissioner to inspect the company's affairs at the Cape, in order to give an exact report of the condition there to their honours in the fatherland. Although for some years, in consequence of the conversion of the administration into a government, according to further orders and arrangements of the 17, this has not been precisely carried out, except that last year, advocate Daniel Haynes, extraordinary counselor of India and admiral of the return fleet was empowered by us for this object. We have in council decided as Mr. Wouter Falconi, counselor of India and late president of the court of justice here has requested leave to return home to appoint him admiral of the fleet and also commissioner to inspect the affairs of the Cape government with authority and power should he find it necessary and expedient to make such further or better regulations for the future as subject to the approval of the directors or their government he may deem proper and likewise in accordance with the particular instructions of the masters for the commissioners and inspectors of the different offices in india as framed of old we therefore order the governor 
W.V. Uh, W.A. van der Stel, or whoever may be in his place at the time of the Commissioner's arrival, and all others, without exception, living under the Cape government, to acknowledge Commissioner Falconeve as such, to respect and obey him, and render him all assistance in the execution of his charge to the utmost of their power, and according to the oath of which everyone is bound to the company, as we have considered this proper in the service of the same, and in fulfilment of the orders of our principles. This is the year, year 17. Dated at Batavia, on the island of Great Java, 21 November 1699. Willem van Oetwoorden, Governor General. Guess what? Willem van Oetwoorden, I think, also sits on the trial of the Prince of Ternate. So once again, you know, um, when you see a Governor General, you should be asking yourself, when was he at the Cape? Did he stop at the Cape? Most likely he did. What was he doing there? Was he a commissioner or was he on his way, you know, out for the first time? Or is he on his way back for the last time with all as a well-seasoned VOC official? Um, so yes, everything connects. Um, and I was um, then, I just, I've, these notes are for myself, of course, Stathemius and Falconeve, two VOC commissioners. They are very interesting. Stathemius arrives during Van Riebeck's time. And poor Van Riebeck has a very hard time because there's a ship called the Erasmus that stops. The crew are completely out of control, deeply disgruntled because they have been made to, you know, go on shore and chop the trees down and they get put to hard labor. Van Riebeck drives them like slaves and um, they, they have a, a mutiny. And the surgeon at the time, who was a Scot of all things, in a Dutch company, a Scotsman, William Robertson, of course, gets to hear of the mutiny and tells Van Riebeck. But it so happens that the return fleet is in Table Bay and um, Stathemius is there. And Van Riebeck, you know, has to look to Stathemius for advice. His hands are tied. And Stathemius, of course, enjoys the moment because he basically says Van Riebeck was too harsh and was, wasn't a, a very kind commander. And he takes the side of the, of the mutineers to a certain extent. And that's a whole story in itself. And I don't want to go into all the details, but um, it, 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 I just want to illustrate the fact that you have this almost a power struggle between the commander and the, the commissioner um, happening at the same time when there's a crisis. And poor Van Riebeck, it gets worse because as this mutiny takes place uh, and all the mutineers get rounded up, the return fleet go wreak havoc on, on what is then Cape Town and they, they, they go on a drunken orgy and they, you know, just help themselves to everything. And uh, they even grab some of the colonists and, and take them forcefully on board saying, come with us. You don't want to be in this country and that's what they actually say they use you know they use strong language like you don't want to be here come with us we'll take you home and many of them do um, because the colonies just started and things are not going very well and uh, the colony can't feed itself and of course rice is being imported to to the cape and it's so interesting even talking about rice you know, I'm always amazed how in Asia and Japan, the Japanese and the Koreans, when I was living in Korea, they would say to me, um, what do you people eat rice in South Africa? And I said, of course we do. You know, it's almost a staple. And, it, and then you think, but why is it a staple? We don't even grow rice. But rice, flesh and artopples, I mean, how can we not have uh, survived without rice, flesh and artopples? But it, this is a legacy from the time of Van Riebeck where rice was being imported from Asia. And it was a staple for the slaves and for the local pop for the local colonial population. So it's always been part of our diet. Um, and we were always connected to, 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 to Asia and rice will always be that connection. Okay. And Falconeer, other VOC commissioner like Stathemius, he's later at the Cape. I discovered just recently two very in interesting aspects about uh, Falconeer. Did you know that he is the man that sanctioned Vergelegen and had it allocated to 
the governor. No one ever talks about Falconi being the guy who caused all the problems to begin with. Poor Willem Adrian van der Stel gets all the blame. Um, that was a VOC commissioner's grant. It was approved and sanctioned by the company. And everyone knew it, including Henning Hasen. And Henning Hasen, who turns out to be the chief, chief instigator against the van der Stels, at this time, he's also sucking up to the commissioner and gets the pacht for meat, for, for the slaughter of meat and providing meat to the, to the company. And he becomes the most powerful free burger. And this is before he decides to take on the van der Stels. And, I, you know, it's so amazing. At one point, he was employing 15 knechts from the company that were basically leased from the company to work for him so that he could pursue his um, slaughter of meat to provide the company. Um, so Falconeed was helping both the van der Stels and he was helping uh, Henning Hasen and his pals. And... You know, this puts a whole new spin on on that so-called um, rebellion at the time. You know, who were these people that decided to take on the van der Stels? And of course, looking back, um, van der Stel gets recalled. Willem Otto and van der Stel gets recalled. His brother gets recalled. Uh, the Dormany gets recalled, Dormany Calden. Simon, Papa, gets left well alone on his estate at Constantia. Then no one wants to go there. And guess what? Willem Adrian van der Stel's successor is a, a relative of the van der Stel family. So the same situation continues. So, you know, it, how successful was Adam Tuss and his cronies? Not terribly successful, ultimately. But maybe successful in the long term, in terms of they wanted to have more wealth and power and influence. Um, and you can see at that time there's an influx of fresh blood from Europe, as opposed to Eurasian VOC officials coming from the eastern side. So the tensions of a of a colony that was being, you know, that was having streams of people coming from either side, from both west and east. Very interesting. Okay, so um, the commissioners, just yeah, as a quick list, um, I'm not going to go um, into all the details. Uh, van, van den Bolgarde, 1655. Reich, Reich, Reichloff van Hunz, 1657. He's at the Cape. Then Johann Cuneus, 1658. Uh, now I want to concentrate on him because he's so interesting. Look at this incredible portrait uh, or painting, shall we say. Um, this is Cuneus with the black hat on his way to the Persian, the Iranian royal court as ambassador for the VOC. This man is the man who sits in judgment on Khrutaka train. He is at her trial. So he's not only in Persia, he's also in Batavia, sitting um, in the Council of Justice. And then he's at the Cape as a VOC commissioner. Uh, Johann Cuneus, he presents um, uh, in 1652 to Safavid Shah Abbas II. And there's his full name, the Sultan Muhammad Murza, also known as Sultan Muhammad Murza. Uh, the Shah Abbas II, Shah of Persia, seventh Shah of the Saf Safafid dynasty, diplomatic gifts. And if you if you Google and look at um, at the Isfahan capital, you'll be amazed at how incredibly splendid the Persian Empire was at that stage, and <clears throat> how important they were to the Dutch in terms of trade. Right, Stathemius is next, as uh, and then just one word about Stathemius. You know, the French have an expression, chercher les femmes, always look to the women. Who was his wife? 
Maria Calandrini, Italiana, daughter of the Calandrini family are super mega powerful banking people. They are related to the Diodatis, they are related to the Burlamakis, they, they have a whole string of Handelshäuser, of trade houses across Europe, from Geneva to Lucca in northern Italy, which was a Protestant stronghold, to France, to the Netherlands, and to London. And these people end up even financing the English crown. Um, in fact, one of the members of this family even ends up being the personal tutor of the Winter Queen and of Prince Henry, who was then the crown prince, but who died and was the brother of James, the, of James, of, of Charles I. So Charles I's elder brother was privately tutored by one of one of the members of this family. So wheels within wheels. Um, this is incredible. Um, if you start looking more closely at these people, a whole world opens up. Okay, continuing with the commissioners, there's Frisius, 61, 62, Hebert de, de Leres, Hermann Klenke van Ordersen, and then Peter Overwater. Peter Overwater is interesting because he's the man that consults with Zacharias Wagenaar, second commander of the Cape, about the right of slaves to be baptized, of slave infants. Because there's a, a huge hoo-ha about a, a Domini arrives at the Cape and he refuses to baptize a slave child. And um, Wagenaar is a seasoned VOC official, he's the second commander, and he's not happy with this um, because he was doing what everyone else was doing, allowing the baptisms. And it turned out after you know investigation that Wagner was right, the Domini was wrong. Um, in terms of, of, of the decisions of the church at that time, these these slaves were entitled to baptism. So Overwater, of course, stops at the Cape and he he gives his money's worth in terms of advice and then he goes goes east. Um, then we've got Dirk Jan Stier, commissioner also sits on Goedeke Train's uh, trial. Um, then we get Hoska, who becomes the first governor at the Cape. Most people think Simon van Assel was the first governor. He was not. Hoska was the first governor, and he was succeeded by Bux, who was the second governor. And then Simon van Assel becomes governor again um, for the third time, or, or the third governor, I should say. Um, Hoska is a very interesting man. Like Wagenaar, he was one of the more experienced commanders at the Cape. Um, he had a long VOC career and he had seen the world. And once again, you know, you have to ask the question, things like when, when I was thinking about Irfa Miro, when, why, why did she get married? She already had two, illegitimate children by Mirov. Why the sudden decision to have her baptized and then her children and then her marriage? And who, who sanctioned it? And if you go into it, you'll see there was a commissioner who comes who finally says, okay, let's go, let's go ahead with this. And he's the man, and this is Stier, Dirk Jan Stier. He says, and we'll give her a dowry as well in lieu of her services to the company. And it's interesting because, you know, uh, recently I've seen on social media a lot of um, people claiming that Yefa Mirov was a slave in Van Ribbick's um, household and that she was never paid. Um, it's not true at all. Um, she certainly came and went and of her own free volition, and she certainly did get paid, even if it was belatedly. Um, for her services as interpreter. Um, anyway, so Hoska is interesting because he comes to the Cape more than once, stops over, and then he ends up being the, the, the colony's first governor. And he also introduces some very important um, uh, legal reforms, one being the, the right of mixed race offspring of slave women to be allowed their freedom ultimately 
And this is interesting too, because you know we always think in terms of slavery being maybe random, impulsive, not subject to any kind of rule, rule frame, framework of rules. But there were very intricate rules that regulated slavery even at that time. And that's where the commissioners come in because we see that Hoska is the first one who looks at the problem and says we need to sort this out. And it's followed by Hendrik van Rieder, the Baron, who comes uh, later uh, as an even more senior BOC commissioner, who then finally consolidates the legal rights of slaves in the slave lodge, of company slaves. Um, <clears throat> right, so then, and the Jakob Karl, Johann van Damme, Payart, van den Broek, Tyson, Hoske, 1671, again, his second time as commissioner. There's an um, artist's impression of Hoske. Hoske is very important because he's also the man who basically is in command of the Cape at the time of the second um, so-called Koi Dutch War. Um, right, and then so here as the um, orders that he gives, um, the formation of positive orders, a volume containing an alphabetical digest of all the instructions and orders issued since the foundation of the colony, ordered by Mr. Van Damme, but not completed with. So he comes and he checks on the previous commissioner's work and says, you you were supposed to do this, you didn't do that, you need to complete this. And of course, he's also instrumental in identifying the site of the new castle, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, the provisions for the slaves. Here we have um, to prevent communication between Europeans and female slaves, male and female slaves to be united as man and wife, but not formally married until baptized and instructed in their mutual obligations. Breach of both engagements to be punished with this difference that those of married females should be punished according to law, but heathen at discretion, according to nature of offense. Company slaves to be forced to attend prayers. Children, the progeny of Europeans and slaves, of whom 12 are then at school, are to be taught and particular care to be taken that they are not alienated, so as to remain in constant slavery, but that they might be might in due time enjoy freedom to which, in the right of their father, they were born. Very interesting. Um, such a small colony. Now, immediately, you know, what should be, what you should be asking is 12 children. Who are they? Who are these 12 children? And we can identify them. We can actually identify them. Who are these 12 children? Um, the Dutch record keeping is, was so good um, that we are able to do this. Um, Right, and then we get to Arnu van Overbeke, <clears throat> another very interesting character. He's the man who stops at the Cape um, as commissioner. He's a magister, he's a master in law, and he looks at the situation and he actually happens on a very, very difficult time when the Cape is commanderless and um, the Council of Policy is half operational and he steps in and he um he tries to clean up the administration but he also then realizes that because of the problem of occupation of colonial occupation and the conquest that had been that had ensued from van Ribbeck's time um he realizes that legally the right of dutch occupation has to be um put right so then he initiates the two treaties and the purchase of the Cape District and of the Hottentots Holland. Um, but he was also a, a very famous, not so famous, but he was a poet of note and he published his poems uh, in his lifetime. And there's one particular poem which is very, very telling. Um, I give it here in Dutch and I've translated it into Afrikaans. Die groot kop van die kop van goeie hoop word oorals dier hoop ontwoof. Watse raad vraag hy, het jy vir my? Ek sê, my vriend, dis a vuilnes, geduld te hee as hier bes, terwyl jy op goeie hoop moet bly. So, of course, it's packed with puns and innuendos. Um, in English, I've translated it, the head of that head of good hope, despaired, alles kaput, ja, and hoping against hope, asked what counsel I could give. I said, my friend, dis a foul nest, 
to be patient and to convalesce is here best, while confined on good hope to rest. And the ironic um, explanation to this poem is the genealogy of the gentleman Albrecht van Bruegel, who was then the second in command of the Cape, commanding officer at the Cape of Good Hope, where he one day coming before me found everything had come to a head, about which he often complained to me. So he's left us this wonderful <clears throat> little nugget of um, inside story of here I was at the Cape, I found the administration, you know, in chaotic, in, in a chaotic situation, and I tried to fix things and, um, and, you know, I did, did what I had to do and I moved on. Um, right, more commissioners, there's a whole list here for Berg, Blom, Van Gunst, Jonge, Seybrand, Arbemer. Uh, Arbemer, very important man. He brings what I didn't realize for a very, very long time is my ancestor through the Vermeulen family, the Stammuder. She was born at the Cape. Although she was known as Katharina van Benghale, she was born at the Cape. But when Arbemer arrives as commissioner, um, he frees, he has a, sl a slave called Titus, Titus the old Roman name, and Titus, or Titus, he frees, and he becomes, you know, um, an important um, uh, naval officer in the VOC. Um, but he returns as a free man to Batavia, and he takes Katarina van Benchala's Cape-born daughter, Katarina, who for some inexplicable reason, is found in some records, not records, but secondary sources, as Katharina Ocklum. And one wonders whether this nickname doesn't come from the fact that she literally did get on board and go to Batavia. And she came back later uh, on the Africa, and she had a child baptized that was born on the voyage back to the Cape. And then she marries the Vermeulen Stamfader. So what's so interesting here is that you've got a... The commissioners were also instrumental in domesticate, uh, you know, in, in the transferal and the movement of domestic slaves between Batavia and the Cape. Uh, and they were selling some slaves too, um, before returning to, to Europe. Okay, so, and just another sign, Arb Arbema has a wonderful artist descent. Uh, so if you Google, you'll see one of his descendants is a famous French artist. Um, very very beautiful paintings. Um, okay, now we get to Hendrik van Reda, van Oost, um, Hendrik van Reda tot Drakenstein, or Drakenstein. He is the most written about commissioner. But sadly, I don't think that his reforms and his um, memorandum have been studied enough. Um, just recently, I was reading a paper by some academics on um, the practice at the Cape where later on in the 1700s, you find that when a company slave wanted to be freed or had the right to be freed because of the, they had done their time, as it were, if you were Yulslach uh, and you had no white ancestry, you then had to serve for 40 years. But once 40 years had passed, you were entitled to your freedom. And if you were half slug, if you were a Eurasian or half caste, um, mixed race, you were um, allowed your freedom at the age of 22 if you were female and 25 if you were male. So that was the legal majority age at that time. So you then see that some of these people they had to pay, of course, for their education, and they had to prove that they were baptized, and they had to prove that they could speak Dutch. But once they could do that, you know, they, they could assert their rights to freedom. But then suddenly, in the records, you start seeing that there's a new condition that starts happening, and that is some slaves are being replaced uh, by other slaves. So basically, when... <clears throat> When you wanted to free your daughter, if you were a slave woman in, in the company lodge and you wanted to free your daughter, you'd have to provide an alternative slave to replace your daughter so that she could then become free. And it invariably was these slaves were male slaves that were then, you know, um, brought into the slave lodge. Um, 
and as I said, I'm reading about this, you know, um, some academics were trying to work out, you know, how did this come to be? Well, the answer is, Van Rieder, if you read his, his instructions very carefully, you'll see that's where it's actually noted. So, okay. Um, moving on. Um, Patbrugge, Haynes, or Haynes, of course, it was fashionable to Latinize your name if you had a law degree. And uh, Walter Jakobs Falconi, I've discussed already. Then of Simons, our friend Simons, I've told you about him being the fiscal at the Cape and that he had also <clears throat> been the prosecuting officer for the trial of Gricky Hrof's murderer. Um, Jan, Johan van Hoeren, very important man. This is the man who marries Jan van Rivers granddaughter. And when he arrives at the Cape, he arrives with his private Chinese physician. And there's there's wonderful um, documentation about the, the, the women all accompanying the, the, the governor, the retiring governor general. And they all, of course, climb uh, Signal Hill and they climb uh, the Lion Mountain, um, Lion's Head. Um, and they leave a little, you know, monument of their of their climb. Then there's Peter de Vos and Johannes van Stierland. Stierland, of course, Dan Slay wrote about recently, um, the late Dan Slay, who passed away recently. Um, he's, one of his last books was about Van Stierland, the man who unwittingly brought the slave, the smallpox um, to the Cape, the, the devastating 1713 smallpox that wiped out a huge swathe of the population. Um, so a very t a key turning point in Cape colonial history, because you know, genealogically, this also means that a lot of a lot of people died who didn't leave descendants, and a lot of newcomers come into the into the picture. So you can count yourself very fortunate if you if you can trace your ancestors to pre seventeen thirteen smallpox epidemic, because. Um, that the society at that time was very different to the post 1713 and as i say this is a very important watershed moment in in the history of of, of south africa in terms of its population demographics um <clears throat> okay um finally um just to justify some of the things i've been saying about the voc commissioners about being good or bad um I wanted to quote William Godwin in his inquiry concerning political justice and its influence on modern morals and happiness. He says, the magistracy, the representatives of the social system that declares war against one of its members in behalf of justice or in behalf of oppression appears almost equally in both cases entitled to our censure. So this is not a woke thing. This is what William Godwin was already saying just before the, the breakout of the French Revolution. It's very clear that um, we 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 have to look at these people critically. Um, we have to see them, warts and all, as people and their legacy in terms of and their impact on the Cape. It's huge, uh, but well worth well worth the exercise. Okay, um, just very briefly, um, I want to go very fast now. Critica train. Here's just a list of the people that were on on the on on her uh, that sat in judgment of her. Jakob Karl. If you look at his um, background, interesting. You'll see that he and his wife leave a slave at the Cape, and you know they go back to Europe. And then when they return east, they pick her pick her up again and they take her along. <laughs> uh, so you can see the kind of arrangements that were being made. Um, then, of course, Cuneus, I've mentioned, he went to Persia as ambassador um, and that wonderful portrait of his and his links to the Kanandrini family. Johann van Damme, interesting man, um, leaves no memory, but, you know, he did, was an inspector at the Cape. Um, Stuer, um, this is the man who sanctions Eva Mirov's wedding. And then the pard, the pardon is by Matsaker. There we have a portrait of him, who was then governor general. And note that his second wife is an Arbama, who also is a VOC commissioner. As I say, it's very complicated, so I don't want to um, go into too much detail um, in this presentation. Now we get to the Prince of Tanata, Mahmoud. Um, 
this is very interesting, I think. I was so surprised when I first started publishing about the rapist prince and being the founding father of the Yonkut family, I got a lot of flack from a lot of people. And there are still people who don't want to accept the evidence. But the evidence is very clear. I'm now more sure than ever before that we are dealing with the same man, Yonkur van Makassar, also known as the Prince of Ternate, and who was exiled for raping. I'm happy to announce that further research has revealed um, the, who he raped, and we now have a name to the victim, which I think is rather uh, informative because it tells me that the search is not over we can actually continue looking through the records and hopefully find out more because guess what we now know that he was formally arraigned by the Schierpen bunk and he was um and the men who decided his fate we find in a resolution and i have transcribed it 3 January 174 Sikren Chili Mulatu Gesede geparenteerd aan den koning van Ternaten en voorskepenen beschuldigd van vrouwenkracht, wordt uit goede inzichten politelijk aan de kaap de goede hoop gebannen. So here we are being told that he's related, he's a relative of the king of Ternate, the sultan, of course, the sultan, and um, he's appeared before the skepenen, uh, which was a, a minor criminal court, and he was accused of rape. And it was out of a political decision, I suppose, um, to banish him to the Cape. So for political reasons. And this is the general resolution at the Castle of Batavia. It's... Um, here they go into the full detail that a good insertion politically not a cop van good whoop gebannen so political expediency um takes precedence and here they say dear uh do den raad ordinaris in president van schipenen christoffel van swall uh zijn de ingebracht in a stukken ten lasten van in and chili maluko so the court papers have been presented to the to the Council of Justice and they're saying that Virgens in Hans Feile Frobenkracht. So this is what they say um a rather iniquitous rape of a woman Duert in Inlander Bedreven. So Inlanders was the Dutch term for the local inhabitants of, of the Dutch colony in, in Indonesia. On Trent in Odefro genaamd Bitter van Sumba op Timor. So now we know that the victim was an old woman named Bita. She was from Sumba, which is an island uh, not so far away from Timor itself. I'll show you a map um, after this. Anyway, here they say that he's to be, um, he's related to the royal family, to the present king of Ternate. And he it's for expediency that it's best to get him out of the way and to remove him and to send him to the Cape. Not to skepen, to versenden naar de Kaap de Goede Hoop, om al daar te verblijven onder het genot van het selwe traktement. And he's to be given basically, yeah, some money for his upkeep, ses ruksdalders, a month, a monthly allowance, which is given to him. And he gets shipped off to the Cape. And here are the men who sit on this council. Johan van Hoorn. Abraham van Ribbik, born at the Cape, son of Jan van Ribbik, who later becomes governor general of the VOC in, uh, at Batavia. Lorenz Pyer, M. Borner, van Swall, de Wilde, Abraham Douglas, a Scottish name. Interesting, he was also commissioner at the Cape. Van der Reind and Adrian van der Stel, who I spoke about earlier in this talk. And signed by Hendrik Zwarte who later becomes governor general. And you'll see Van Swall, 
um, Zwar uh, de Kruen, Van Woerden, Van Riebeek, they all become governors general. They all get to serve as highest ranking VOC official in the East, in the Dutch East Indies. On one page, you see, see a whole conglomeration or collection of very powerful men. So there's uh, your map of Indonesia, and you can see there is Sumba. I don't know if you can see with my arrow. Um, that's or my cursor. This is Sumba, and that's Timor. And Java, of course, is over here. So it's these are the lesser Sunda islands, and then at the bottom you've got Sumba. So now, of course, I'm burning to know more about Bita van Sumba. How did she come to be a slave in Jakarta, or Ternate rather, um, or actually Batavia? So what was the prince himself doing in Batavia, and why was he not in Ternate? And what were the circumstances surrounding the rape of this old woman, who now has a name? This is very satisfying, um, kind of a... Hmm, kind of a just dessert, I suppose. One feels that a kind of justice is served when you can finally reveal, you know, the identity of the victim. Um, it's a kind of a humanizing process, I suppose. Um, Johannes, okay, and then of course, Johannes Kops was also mentioned. Oh, he was sick at the time of the decision, but he was on the Council of Justice. Kops is an interesting man because he's one, he is responsible for he stop over at the Cape, he supplies one of the very first male slaves to Jan van Riebeek, um, who becomes um, part of van Riebeek's household. So the Kops family are well entrenched VOC um, officials. Van Dam, we know, had interesting uh, interactions with Kempfer, the famous German who came to Japan as a spy and of course supplied him with the Japanese dictionary before Kempfer actually comes to Dejima uh, to then spy on the secretive Japanese nation and to reveal what's happening inside Japan at the time of the Bakufu of the, uh, and of the Sakoku, the Japan's enforced isolation where the Dutch were relegated to this artificial island at Nagasaki and only allowed to step on Japanese soil when when they had to go to um, to Dejima to pay tribute to the shogun. Um, okay, so here we have, um, I'm not going to go into more details here. Here we've got um, Van Huren, I've told, mentioned him already. Um, so much, there's so much. There's Abram van Riebeek, born at the Cape. Interesting man. Um, Unfortunately, not given much attention in South Africa, and yet you know he was born, he was he was Cape born, and he had such an illustrious VOC career. Um, yeah, who also stopped over the Cape, you know, even after he was born there. Of course, he of course he was sent to. Remember, at the time that Stathemius was stopping at the was at the Cape, and when the Erasmus mutin mut mutiny was happening and when the return fleet um, was running amok, there was um, Abram being sent to Europe to go and get his legal education at the University of Leiden. And of course, then he comes back, he returns east, he stops at the Cape again, and then he goes to Batavia, and then he eventually rises to governor general. So um, we even have some a diary of Abram when he stops at the Cape after he gets his law degree and where he witnesses the arrival of Malagasy slaves at the Cape. Um, yeah, okay, so moving on, there's also Pai Borana van Swall. Um, some lovely um, information about these people. Yeah, van Swall is called in lustig karakter, licht geraakt en ongelooflik koppig. <laughs> so we get some graphic personal descriptions of these people. Um, okay, um, moving on. Herman de Wilde, Abraham Douglas, the Scottish, Scotland-born VOC councillor, um, Anne van Rijn, and Adrian van der Stel, I've told you, who owned land at the Ode of Einberg, which also belonged to Konrad Fitt, who's my ancestor, 
And of course, it's through Konrad Fitt's wife that we descend from Eva Mirov. So connections within connections. Um, okay. Um, yeah, Adrian van der Stel, by the way, was also governor of Ambon. And um, Ambon is, of course, was the, the heart of the spice trade. That island, you know, was the scene of the bloodiest massacre by the VOC of the island's population and replacement of the of them by other um, slaves to to harvest the nutmeg, and um, the killing or the uh, of these people of the island's population was done with the help of Japanese mercenaries. Many people don't realize that you know um, Japanese mercenaries were being used to. Um, as soldiers of the VOC. Uh, when I speak to this and to Japanese and tell them about it, there's, you know, there's just disbelief or denial or can't be, not possible, didn't happen. Um, but the records are there. Um, and it's important that these records be, be become better known, really. And um, the good thing is, you might, you should be asking me, how did I happen on Vita van Sumba? The records are there. If you go and look, you'll find. Um, the VOC legacy is huge. The paper trail, the um, the, the uh, carbon footprint of the VOC is vast, so vast that it's foolish not to not to make use of that opportunity. And it's, it's almost criminal to think that we haven't tapped into that um, wonderful resource um, sufficiently and we have everything at our fingertips like never before and we're still not doing much about it so my message here is you know skunt them as they say in danish you know do something about it do it get involved and um, know your history know your history because um it's going to just give you some so much more insights into how we came to be where we are if you want to understand why things are so bad look back and some of the explanation will be you will find in the voc records okay just out in front of soul coming back to the man look who he was married to elizabeth angelica brula maki daughter of benjamin brula maki who was in hoogly in bengal with funnet handel heis brula maki to amsterdam very wealthy, wealthy Dutch merchant um, of Italian extraction, Italian Protestants from Lucca that go to Geneva. Um, and look at what happens to his family. He marries into this into Swedish aristocracy. And here you have the the Fins, Finspong Castle, Finspong Castle in Sweden, um, which passes to Johann van der Stel, Freiherr van der Baroni van Hyck. Hicklum here van Lunen. A lot of interesting information about the van der Stels, which people have not really looked at. Um, the networks are astounding. And then there's Zwarte Kroon um, as governor general, also there. He has a very impressive career. Um, I no time now to go into everything. Um, he's buried. I will end with him. There's his grave in Indonesia. Hopefully, it will still continue to survive. But be warned, things are not looking good in Indonesia in terms of preservation of the past. And the same, the same problem lies ahead for us in South Africa. We have to be very careful that this rich legacy does not get totally eviscerated um, by current political emotion. Right, that's it. I have nothing more to say um, except to rather encourage you to ask me questions and hopefully I can give you some answers. Thank you very much. I'd like to hear the whole Katrine story. 
kan ek Afrikaans mm-hmm. praat, verstaan? Ja, zeker. Die, die hele, hoekom was Grote Katrijn verhoor in die Kaap? Ek weet nou, sy was verhoor in Batavia. Nee, sy was nie ja, ge- Kaap, verhoor aan die Kaap nie. Sy was verhoor um, op, in, in Batavia en, en uitgestuur Kaap toe. Geban, verban oh. Kaap. Ja, ja. So die nee, mense sy, wat daar verhoor het, wat die van gepraat het, was tijdens haar hofzaak in Batavia. In ge- Batavia, precies. Ja. O, so toe sy in die Kaap aankom, toe sy klaas beskuldig en verskuldig en toe, toe we sy nie weer in die hof nie. Ja. O, nee, baie dankie nie. Ek het gedog sy was in die kaap ook, uh, ook in die hof gewees. So, dit so, is sy was betrokken in ander, ander sake, maar, maar nie, nie die, die, die verloor. Die, 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 die moordzaak. Die eerste ja. saak, die moordzaak, ja. So die moordzaak, maar, maar die, die punt van, van, van my, my, my praaikie is gaan oor die feit dat die mense, die mans wat daar op haar verhoor gesit het, was ook by die kaap gewees. O, so hulle het die kaap gekeken. As commissarisse, hulle het, hulle het, nie weet, so die hele punt is, hulle het gekom en ge, so, so, ons, ons weet van gevallen waar Groote Katrijn is reeds in die kaap en dan kom een POC commissaris wat voorheen op haar verhoor gesit het, oh. bes, besoek hy die kaap en hulle ontmoet weer. Ok, nie. So, dit... Die mense het, you know, they knew each other, they knew about each other, they had met before. Mm. En, 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 en die groot, die weet, wat, wat groot ek trein betref, die v- v- vraag daar is, hoe is dit dat sy um, gepardoneer, om die, om die Nederlandse woord te gebruik, hoe is dit dat sy vir die tweede keer gepardoneer is. En die antwoord le in die feit dat die besoekende commissaris was in staat om dit te doen, om te sê, oké, okay, ek ken vir jou. En jy, en te stuit, oké, okay, ons, ons, ons maak een, een nieuwe plan met jou, want jy weet, sy het mos speciale toestemming gekry om te trouw, en onthou die, uh, toe sy verban is, was dit op voorwaarde dat sy nie terug kan gaan Batavia toe nie. Sy moest levenslang kaap toe verband wees. En toe is dit nou ook verander. En sy is vrygestel van dit en toestemming is gegeen om so dat sy kon trouw met Anthony van, Jans van Bengale. En hy was een van die slawe in die commandeerse huishouding. Die commandeer in Batavia? Nee, die commandeer in die kaap. In die kaap. Ja, maar hoekom het hulle dan teruggegaan Batavia toe? Hulle wou, maar hulle het besluit om nie te gaan nie, want hulle het bankrot gespeel. Dit, dit, die leven in die kaaf was so erg, hulle kon dit net nie maak nie. Maar toe, 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 toe sterk man en vrou, jy weet, in, in 1683. Want sy was die tweede keer gepardoneer. Nou, die eerste hoofdzaak ja. is nou vir die moord, en wat was die tweede jy? Wel kijk, die, 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 sy is gepardoneer vir die eerste keer, omdat vir, vir die manslag nou wat gebeur het. Ja. En, en het is gesê, oké, okay, um, sy het Klaas van Malabar doodgemaak, maar dit was nie aspris nie, dit was a, um, ongeluk. een ongeluk tussen hulle, en, en uh, sy moet eerder kaap toe gaan as, as kompanie slaffen en levenslang. Um, en toe besluit hulle dat sy sy hoef nie levenslang een kompanie slaffen te bly nie. Sy, sy is vrygestel. O, so dit, dit was die tweede, die tweede, tweede pardoneer. Ja. Die tweede een was toe dat haar levenslange ver, uh, slaffen was toe opgehef. Opgehef, ja. O, nee, maar baie dankie. Nee, hoe kom ek belangstel as grote Katrijn is deel van my voorgeslachte en Ek het nog altyd die biekie wat jy nou oor haar geskryf het en ek gelees het en ek gedink sy was a, kan het seker nie sê, maar sy was a moerse vrou gewees. Sy was, sy was goed, sy was speciaal gewees. Ek het baie, baie bewondering vir Grote Katrijn. O, dit is interessant. Wel, die ja, hele ding is, soos ek sê, mens moet vraag, hoe het, hoe het sy dit recht gekry, dat sy nou, jy weet, so licht afgekom het, jy weet, eindelijk, en, en dinge het um, eindelijk uitgewerkt van, op een manier, en sy het ja, vryheid gekry, so sy moes daarom een bykie um, invloed gehad het ook, jy weet. Maar ek denk al later in lewe het ook bewys dat sy kwaliteit was, sy was nie een stik rabies gewees. 
Uh, sy is nou getrouwd met uh, die ou van Wengale en die kinders en is ge, gedoop en dit dink asof dit toe redelijk goed gegaan het met al later. Ja, ja. Dit is nie die, die snijman ou wat weggeraak, het is nog vir my steeds interessant wat het toe van hom geword. Wel ek vermoed hy is uh, Mauritius toe, want um, daar was een hele klomp uh, van die um, van die garnizoen wat nou Mauritius toe gegaan het met die opening van die van die kolonie daar. En ons en, en ek het nou reeds bewijse ge, gekry van van Maria van Bengalus uh, houman of bottelkie saamdrink. So um, Hagens was Mauritius toe en um, verskye ander vryburgers wat jy weet besluit hulle wil nou een nieuwe begin maak. Um, oh. en, en ek dink um, my ansel is so twee minnaars is ook uit die land uit en ek dink ook eerst Mauritius toe. Dit is nou van ek, As ek, ek en, het, en de koning. Ek, ek het half contact verloor met Snijman toe hy Robin Eiland toe verban is. Ek het toe maar aan Vaarhuis daar oorlede of so iets. Ek dink nie, daar is niks op rekord nie. Ek dink hy het sy, sy um, tyd ge, gedien en ek dink hy het die eerste skip, ge, jy weet, hy, die eerste geleentheid om weg te kom, het hy, jy weet, um, bes, besluit hy, hy moet weg. So, en ek, ma, ek vermoed Mauritius toe. So hy is, goeie, 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 heel, heel, heel moendlik is hy op Mauritius dood. Eerder as, um, en ongelukkig is die rekords van Mauritius nie, het, het net, 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 as, as nou, bestaan nie meer nie. Wow. So, Baie dankie, nie. dankie. Uh, Mensel, ek wil graag weet. Sorry, jou... man, can you do it in English, please? There's more English people here. I'm sorry, 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 Mansell. Um, or oh, sorry to the English speakers. Um, your sources, um, were you using Indonesian sources or where does your sources and can you access them online? How do you get to your sources? Ah, okay, good question. Um, so you know I'm sitting in Japan, right? Yes, and that's why I'm, I'm asking. I, I am so chuffed because when I when I found um, Bita van Suba's um, um, the, the decision to actually banish the prince to the Cape, um, I found I I got that online. I was ah. able to to track it down and to look at the um, digitalized um, record at the Batavia at at Jakarta archives. Can you give us a link maybe in the chat section of where we can search? <clears throat> yes, okay. Um, but basically, um, I must just warn you because I, I tried to access it today and I can't get in anymore. Oh, <laughs> but, okay. But, but the reason being, um, you know, the whole TANAP project has also crashed. So mm. we don't oh. know what's going to happen to to all the transcriptions of the resolutions. Uh, so that's the CAPE records as well and the inventories. And um, there's a problem with the Indonesian authorities because, you know, um, this is the power struggle. They're saying it's our records and after independence, we don't bow to our Dutch colonial overlords. So, you know, um, if you want to access them, you, we will decide when and how and who gets to, to access them. So, um, meanwhile, those records are also perishing more uh, so quickly. And, you know, I, I thought about that today as well. We are very lucky in South Africa, you know, because the uh, often I show family pictures and photographs to my Japanese friends, and they all they can't believe that that I have so many photographs of different generations. But it's so hot and humid here in Japan that everything perishes very quickly, and I never thought about the humidity factor, you know, because in South Africa we don't have all that humidity except in Durban, maybe. But we are very lucky in terms of we can preserve our records um, a little longer, maybe because of the of the environmental factors but um the records are perishing very fast um and who's going to pay for their upkeep and are the indonesian authorities in any position to really conserve them that's the next question and you know do the dutch care enough because they're getting so much flack about their colonial past that they might also be saying you know why should we bother no one will no one that just shows us up in a bad light and everyone's using it against us so yeah let it just all, you know, perish. 
are there records not in in archives then climate control? they are in archives but you know like our own archives i mean how do, for how long are they going to be well maintained and kept true true <laughs> hmm. but but anyway so yeah um I'm always amazed, you know, that that when I have discovered stuff, even like Khrutika Train, I'm worried that there are Khrutika Train descendants out there, and we know this because we've just spoken to one, right? Um, and I'm one too. I'm, um, I also descend from Khrutika Train. But I was, I've been hoping, I mean, I published in 1995 that research on Khrutika Train, on her trial, and, and brought it to light. And since then, nobody's gone... No one's taken the trouble to see if they, where if the there are any other papers in Batavia. There has to be. For instance, you know, when when she was arraigned, there would have been attestations um, by the witnesses or by or the surgeon who would have done the autopsy. Um, these papers would have been drawn up. The question is, have they survived? And if they asked, if they have survived, why is no one looking for them? And they should be looking for them because, I mean, don't we want to know more? Of course we do. I want to know. And can I just ask about the VOC documents? Is hmm. it in our Cape Town archives or also? Yes. Cape Town archives. But, you know, nowadays you can even go online and you can look at, 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 at records in the Netherlands too. And, 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 um, and Jakarta, and uh, of course Sri Lanka, and you can find these people. Mm. Just just recently, I found the um, Train Russ's eldest son. He went to Ceylon to Sri Lanka, and um, I was able to find his um, his death record in Sri Lanka and his marriage. He married a also a woman of slave origin, but the Russ family, yeah, the eldest branch actually ended up in Sri Lanka. Sure. Sorry, I just have another question. I'm uh, so you in the <laughs> beginning, you know, I'm just very excited. You were talking about younger people not taking this up, so I'm one of those younger people that that are taking up genealogy. So, um, so I've only started, so I'm going to ask a lot of stupid questions. So, no, so no, I've but, I mean, my... they're not stupid, they're <laughs> important questions. <laughs> no, but I mean, a lot of these um people on on this um. Zoom session. I've been on this journey very long, and I mean, so so I've got heritage going back to Portugal. I've got Ferraris, and I've got um, heritage going back to France. So, do you know if those records are online? Um, does anybody have links where I can start looking? Um, my yes. my French heritage is in Blois. Um, it's the Brivar. I just, I'm just kind of stuck and don't know who to reach out to ask for guidance. That's, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Well, my answer to you would be, don't look for guidance. You don't need to just look yourself <laughs> because sometimes the guidance can, can also put you onto all kinds of tangents and, and, you know, down rabbit holes, which would, and, and also at research that's, that's been done or that is not well done. And, you know, then you're going to be taken, um, you know, you can be misled and uh, again and taken. So just find the records yourself and try and get to the original records. That That's the only way is to, to be absolutely certain. Um, th that's why the archival records are, are paramount. You need to look, you know, just to give you another example, I've, I've been, I've just transcribed now the, all the trial papers, Ricky Krof, and um, uh, the Stam, the Fisser Stam, or one of them. And she, um, those papers are online and they're very legible, actually. And I'm astounded that no one has, has you know, transcribed them. And there's so many other court cases and, and, and other documents relating to the to our ancestors that that should by now should have been transcribed um the links are all there on the genealogical society's web page go, to those, go go to those actual archival links and start looking at those documents hello mansell um hmm, if yes I say something is nikki 
Um, she can look on to Family Search and through FamilySearch.org, uh, she can go to virtually any European country, like Portugal and all these places, Germany. Uh, I've been on the German site through Family Search, and um, you can get all the all the records there, perhaps. Yeah, well, not all the records though. I mean, Family Search, remember, is connected to the Church of the Latter Day Saints, the Mormons, right? And Great. it's a wonderful it's a wonderful resource, of course, and I use it too. But it's mainly focused on baptisms and marriages and deaths. But that's a starting point. That's a starting, it's a starting point. point. But, you know, I think the question here is how to get beyond that. Okay. Because Thanks, anyway. you know, it's very it's easy to look up um, on, on family search and you'll get the basics and the bare bones. But if you really want to know more about those people and their lives, you're going to have to go to the, ex the, to the records that have survived. And they are normally in archival institutions. And then it would be best to to look at those records yourself and then to to make sense of them. Sorry, can I just yeah. I'm on yeah. Family Search, Nikki. Where do I find the the countries? On familysearch.org. Just type in Google Family Search and and um yeah, you will find this the site. There. Yeah, so I'm on the site there, but where do I find the different countries? The archives. Uh, if you type in a name, they ask uh, what country, and where we say South Africa, you can just put. Oh, in... I see. Of course. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. Right. Okay. Thanks, Bye. Montela, I also have two EFAs from the Carp. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, they seem to be less documented than uh, Grote Katrain, for instance. Where where can I find it? It seems as though it was easy. Just call the lady Eva and say Eva van die Kaap. So there are a number of Eva's van die Kaap. <laughs> Is there somewhere where we can we, we can get more information on them? Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I think what it's very important to, to state from the outset that Eva van die Kaap um, is ambiguous um, depending on the period. If it's early Cape, it's likely to be a slave or former slave or a freed slave. Um, but as we, as the colony increases in size and population, the indigenous people start being brought into the fold. So she could, if her funder carp could even be Hottentot or Bastard Hottentot, as they were known at that time, or uh, even Bushman. So, um, you, time period is important, but you know, I find the early records are actually so are, are easier because and better documented, because you can imagine the colony is so much smaller. It's a micro, micro, micro microcosm, but as the colony expands, then the records also start becoming less uh, focused, I suppose, and more administration, you know, um, inclined. So then um, you, there's less information about the people. It's one of those strange quirks because we know more about my Ansela and Grote Katrain than we do about some of the European stumblers. Even Maria van Rivik, we know almost very little about her in comparison. We, we, we can even quote an act, actual words of Kurdika Train from the records, but nothing from Maria van Rivik, nothing whatsoever. So unfortunately, this is the, 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 the way it is. You know, the, uh, the records are not going to cover everybody equally because those records were kept there for, for the purpose of the VOC or, or the purpose of the church. So once again, when you're looking at a document, you should be saying, what is this document? What can this document tell me? Um, and um, realize that it has limitations or that it can possibly lead to other documents. So your earphones, if you want to trace them, um, if it's a later period, there are slave records. I would definitely look at the only, the only success likely that that will happen is if you look at everyone surrounding that person. Then you have to look at at who she marries, if she's left any any legal papers, any inheritance. Um, who are the witnesses to her children's baptisms? Who are the witnesses, if any, to her baptism? If she's an adult baptism, 
who was baptized with her and in desperation to then even research the people that were baptized with her because sometimes they do link but this you know the sad truth is that you just got to keep on looking and looking and in the end it's like a dragnet you have to bring in all every, everyone involved in the hope that you will then identify them more more uh, in more detail because so it's not easy it's, it isn't easy it, it is because because the, the one was the the stammuder from the one family side and the other EFA from the carp was was later so that's why i think they were two so different the first groups. one which family is is the first EFA? it's mole m-o-l-l that was Mol. around 1756 but you see, that's already quite late, and that's why it's, it's, yes. uh, we, we yes, don't know so already, much about it's already it. late. No, and that, probably your best source right now would be Werger, Werger's Personalia, the Germans of the Cape. Yeah, and and he he was, more, uh, you know, know your know your archival historians as well. John Werger was professor of German at Stellenbosch University, and the man, he's you know he's so unappreciated, but his work on the German immigration to the cape is magnificent Fantastic, yes. he very seldom makes mistakes and he was extremely thorough and if you look at the sources uh, under the mole family you'll see that even he sometimes you know he if he doesn't know he what he, there's no sources but if he's found a will or if he's found um, an attestation or if he's found a um, well, freedom papers he would he, he normally notes it and if he has, go and look up those documents yourself and read them because there could be clues in those documents that could take you further. But look at who the witnesses are. Look at, you know, at the, but 1756 is late. So, but, you know, the census rolls would help. Look at what property they had, if they had slaves. Um, those records are available and online. And the genealogical society, you know, has some of the best links for that. The which society? Gene genealogical society of South Africa, GSSA. Oh, yeah. mm. GSSA. Their website okay. is 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 a mine of information. There's so many wonderful links to to these records. I'll have to do some more work. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much. My pleasure. Okay, thank you, David. Last word, and then we say goodbye to everybody. Yes, yes. Th thank you very much, Mansell. It's been a thoroughly enjoyable morning, and with with lots of interest. I'm glad. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad that that you like to spread and find out what the ancestors were, were like. I find one of the I find it frustrating when people just want to collate lots of people that they related to without knowing who they were, or what they did. I mean, that is to me is far more interesting to know how those people lived, what their lives were, what, what their lives were like. And from that, as you know, we, we, we gain information uh, and can go forward with things. But uh, it's been it's been great. And, and I'm sure you need to go to bed now. But, but thank you very much indeed. It's been it's been it's, it's been very stimulating uh, morning. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your kind words. Thank you.